Really a tremendous pleasure uh, for me to welcome Brad Smith here uh, today. Uh, you know, he is in the middle of all of the issues we have been discussing and has, you know, fantastic perspective. Uh, as you know, Brad Smith is general counsel and executive vice president in charge of legal and corporate affairs at Microsoft, uh, where he has been for a number of years. and. Um, uh, he's also Microsoft's corporate secretary and chief compliance uh, officer. Um, he's very active in a number of civic and not-for-profit organizations um, and uh, really um, uh, is just, uh, I think, the, one of the country's leading thinkers around the complexities of economic globalization as it affects uh, the subjects we've been discussing today. So I think we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation, and I really thank you for your willingness to do so. L let me start us off with, again, a very open-ended question, because as general counsel of a leading global technology company that provides cloud services, I think you're seeing different kinds of challenges and some similar challenges around the world. Um, and I wonder if you could highlight for us as you think about the global environment in which you're operating uh, and the concerns that you're experiencing around privacy and security and safety um, uh, as, as at least three major benchmark uh, questions. Um, what are you experiencing and what are you most concerned about? Sure. Well, first of all, Merritt, it's great to be here. Great to be here with you. Great to be back uh, at Columbia, where uh, I went to law school, and it's great to see you know, so many familiar faces and friends in the room. Um, this is an extraordinary time. I mean, if you care about technology and if you care about the world, um, this is really an unprecedented time. Uh, and it's easy to say that in a general form because the Internet has obviously become so important to virtually everything. Uh, I think that's a theme you've heard throughout today. Uh, but I, in fact, think we're sort of living through the ripple effects uh, of a set of, of, of events and issues uh, that have been really captured, uh, not just today, but uh, around the world in recent years. I'd, I'd really point to three. Uh, the first sort of tidal wave was unleashed, uh, you might say, on June the 5th, 2013. That was The Guardian's first story. Uh, the first Snowden revelation about the telephone uh, metadata collection program. But you know, fundamentally, there have been a series of stories uh, that have put trust in many people's minds, especially government officials' minds around the world, in question. Can they really trust technology? Can they trust American technology? Then you had a second sort of wave that was unleashed, and I'd say it really started last November. November 24th was the day when employees at Sony came to work and found that their system didn't work. And we all came to learn what was concluded, that this was the result uh, of a cyber attack by North Korea. Really mounted, I think you could say, as retaliation for an exercise of free expression. Uh, and then the third was uh, this January, January the 7th. That was the date of the Charlie Hebdo attack. Uh, and you've seen this, this concern in Europe uh, about how the internet is being used uh, to foment terrorism. So here you have these three factors. You know, is trust still viable? Um, you know, is cybersecurity is more real? Public safety and terrorism is a concern? All of these things have come together. Uh, and fundamentally what we're now seeing is governments around the world respond. Uh, and there is a, a set of different regulations that are being considered. Um, as we track the world, which we do basically every week and month, we really see six categories where there's new kinds of regulations emerging. Data residency, in other words, rules that say the data has to stay inside a country's borders if it falls into a certain category. Data retention, companies have to retain user information for a period of time. Uh, local security standards, software, hardware, need to be designed in a way that comports with a specific uh, security standard. Uh, encryption rules, and specifically access to in, in encryption keys. Uh, content rules, you see that in France uh, and on the continent uh, these days, so concern about extremist content. And finally, the sort of extraterritorial reach, uh, including by the United States government, uh, trying to access data that's in other jurisdictions. So 
At the end of the day, what does it all mean? Well, I think it has profound ramifications for whether data and ideas can move around the world. It has profound ramifications for whether technology companies are going to be able to serve the world. Um, ultimately, it has profound ramifications for whether the, the tech sector's 40 or 50 year history of just being able to create a product once and sell it to the world rather than localize it country by country is going to continue. Um, and it has profound recommendations finally to whether we have a singular internet or one that is increasingly fragmented. I think that in a way is the fundamental question that is being discussed today and tomorrow here at Columbia. Mm -hmm. Well, before we go into some of the spe specific elements of that, let me ask you a, a, a admittedly academic question, <laughs> which is uh, where in that landscape do you think that there is developing uh, something we could call international norms around these things? I mean, is there, you know, do you think there is some shared uh, uh, consensus emerging in practices around transparency or around uh, uh, some of these areas, and where do you think uh, you know that exists to the extent it does? Uh, I think that's a great question, and in fact, there are certain international norms that are emerging. Um, I think, in the first instance, you almost have to define, as you you know, it's an academic question. Uh, it, what is the definition of an international norm? Uh, you know, and I would say to a degree it's something that conforms with well-established principles that are, uh, are recognized around the world and some consensus, as you put it, some prevailing practice. Uh, and I do see five or six areas you know, where there are international norms uh, emerging. Transparency, it's interesting that you mentioned that because I think that is the uh, perhaps leading example. Um, to date, the international norms that have been emerging have been rules that have, in fact, permitted greater transparency. Um, because it's worth remembering that you know, Microsoft as a company, Google as a company, other companies as companies, we had to sue our own government just to secure our rights under the First Amendment to the Constitution to share with the world the kinds of legal orders we were getting. Uh, but I do see that kind of transparency being embraced increasingly as an international norm. And it won't surprise me if it actually goes from something that we're permitted to do uh, to something that increasingly technology suppliers are required to do, because mm -hmm. I think transparency is such uh, an important area. I do think in some of the other areas um, that I mentioned, we are seeing some international norms emerge. For example, uh, you know, data residency is a hot topic. You know, most people in the tech sector don't like data residency requirements. These rules that say that you know, if we're in the cloud services business, we have to keep data resident in a certain country. The reality is for public sector data, you, know, you could argue that that's an emerging norm. The US government, in a practical sense, requires that US public sector data stay in the United States. You know, we see a number of other countries uh, where, where that is similar. Um, you know, so there, there are some steps where we're seeing some, some norms emerge. Mostly, however, I would say this is early days. Uh, and mostly what you see is a lot of debate. And there's some days where uh, I have to admit, you know, I feel like my job is sort of you know, running the volunteer fire department. And we're just trying to keep the fire from spreading uh, so that we don't have chaos everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'd like to ask you about jurisdiction. I think you, uh, Microsoft is really taking a stand to protect the privacy of customer uh, information by challenging a US demand for customer data, I guess, is stored in Ireland. And um, if you don't mind talking about ongoing litigation, which I, I think I've seen you do before. So uh, uh, could you share with us your thinking about why you chose to challenge this? Sure. Yeah, no, 20 years ago, the job of a general counsel is to say, well, I can't talk about that. That's ongoing litigation. <laughs> and today it's, uh, well, that's ongoing litigation, so it's my job to talk about it. Um, and yes, we, uh, you know, we, we've sued the, the US government three times on this set of issues. The third one was around the specific extraterritorial reach. Uh, the US government served a, a warrant uh, on Microsoft here in the Southern District of New York, uh, reaching a email content uh, that uh, resides uh, in our data center in Ireland. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, you know, we put email uh, in the data center that's close to the customer. So we 
put email for Americans in data centers in the United States. We put email for Europeans and uh, people in other parts of that uh, region you know, in Ireland. Uh, and we've contested that, uh, saying that you know, under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act, the ECPA, the law that is the basis for this, uh, Congress never wrote it in 1986 with an intent uh, to reach outside U.S. borders. Search warrants have always understood uh, to stop at the water's edge. Uh, and we don't believe under this statute uh, the U.S. government can reach that. There's also, a, I think, a pretty fundamental principle uh, at stake here. And we've sought to raise this in, in the case. We basically said, look, if the U.S. government is simply going to try to reach email simply because it can and it wants access to it, regardless of where the email is stored, then it has to be prepared for a world in which other governments do exactly the same thing. Alibaba recently announced it's building a data center in the United States. How do Americans feel about the possibility that there might be a day <coughs> when their personal information is in an Alibaba data center and the Chinese government says that it wants it. And it takes the position that it can ignore US law, it can ignore US territory, it can ignore US sovereignty, it can just get it because it can as long as it's in conformity with Chinese law. This is not a world that will make it easy for people to have confidence in technology. I think fundamentally what we see everywhere is people want to be protected by their own laws. Uh, and this puts at risk the fundamental ability, fundamental ability of Americans and people everywhere to have their rights protected by their own laws. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the principle of extraterritoriality is one the U.S. has championed in some settings. So what, what is the response to that? Well, we've had some good conversations, I would say, um, you know, in, with the executive branch at the White House. I think there's a growing recognition of the issue. Uh, I'm actually encouraged uh, by some of the developments in Congress, and I know that's not a, a sentence that you hear very often. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because we recognize that a solution is needed. Yeah. Uh, and there's a bipartisan uh, piece of legislation in both the Senate and the House, it's called the LEADS Act, um, that would refine ECPA, and it would basically say that the U.S. government can reach co email content and this kind of content on an extraterritorial basis, but only when it belongs to a U.S. citizen or resident. Mm -hmm. uh, this has now more than 50 co-sponsors in the House, uh, for example. Um, it would also encourage uh, and really require the executive branch to take new steps to fashion an international model. And we've called for an international model. We need governments to work together. We believe that governments, in fact, can work together if they'll put their minds to it. Um, but we're going to, frankly, I think we need to win this case in order to call the question to really push forward a debate that can lead to new solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Let me take you back to the issue of data localization and fragmentation that you alluded to. And you know, we've had some discussion already today about, uh, about these issues. And I think one of the uh, questions that has come up is what are the harms associated with data localization? Uh, harms to entrepreneurs, uh, harms to an economy. Of course, you can identify harms to uh, uh, cloud providers, but mm -hmm. could you speak more broadly about the harms as you see them? Well, I think there's a, there's a couple of things to think about. First, in the short run, uh, you know, to the extent that you, you have more data residency rules around the world. I mean, if you just conjured up uh, a hypothesis that said by 2016, you know, 190 countries around the world are all gonna require that all data reside within their own borders and not leave. Um, well, first of all, the free flow of information around the world would be undermined. Um, a lot of services uh, would be undermined. Uh, and more than anything else, you would radically drive up costs at a relatively early stage of this technology's and this industry's mm -hmm. development. Uh, yeah, I, I think you know, 30 years from now, you know, this building's still gonna be here. This hall is probably gonna be just as beautiful as it is today. Mm -hmm. And everybody inside is probably going to be accustomed to uh, you know, an era where there are data centers everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not yet at that point, and if you, you know, required the construction and operation of that many data centers, 
you know, you'd actually put you know, the internet or at least some of these services out of certain populations reach. I think that would be a bad thing. I think there's a second thing that one needs to really think hard about um, as one conjures up different scenarios around the localization of technology. Fundamental to innovation, especially for startups, you know, is the ability to create an application that can then be distributed basically globally um, in, a, in a relatively or completely singular way uh, on an operating system. You know, so if you're a startup and you're creating an app for an iPhone or an Android phone or say a Windows PC, um, because there's a unified technology platform, which really means that you have the same application programming interfaces or APIs everywhere, you know that once you create this app, it'll work. Um, that's frankly why people can aspire to graduate this spring and be running a company by December. Because yeah. they can get a few people together and create an app. If you start to localize uh, technology standards in a way that breaks and fragments uh, that kind of API infrastructure, you suddenly deprive people of the ability to innovate in that fast-moving, inexpensive way. And so I think what we're going to see over the next few years is governments are going to understand this. I think many of them do. And I think what they'll probably try to do is thread a needle. They're going to try to figure out how they can protect security in a way that gives them local confidence. In other words, they want software that conforms with a security standard that they believe is strong, that other governments cannot break, but they're going to have to be extraordinarily careful so that in doing that, they don't break the API platform as a whole in a way that would just sort of fragment the app ecosystem that's driving innovation around the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you, very important point. Uh, let me ask you a, 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 another question before we do open it up for some um, participation from, from our very expert audience. And that is, as you think about where the solutions lie around some of these problems, there are some dimensions that I think international trade agreements are trying to address. And, and now we're in a very vigorous period around um, a transatlantic and transpacific, and I think the Congress actually managed to eke out a vote yesterday around trade promotion authority. Um, so where, where do you think we're going to advance an international dialogue around these issues? Is it trade agreements? Is it bilateral uh, consultation? Is it the MLAT process? How do you see this might evolve at the international level? Well, I, I think it may almost require all of the above. Yep. Um, you know, certainly we need a new generation of trade rules, and some of what's taking place right now is designed to advance that. Uh, last week, Robert Holliman, the deputy trade representative, gave, I thought, a very good speech where he, he outlined a dozen principles you know, that could form the foundation uh, for more international standards. Uh, I think uh, that some of this is going to have to require a bilateral initiative. You know, what we've seen over the years, and you obviously know far more about this than me, uh, is in the context of trade, trade rules are established, but then they contain national security exceptions. A lot of the current debate actually is, in fact, around the scope of national security issues. So I don't think you'll see that unfold in a broad multilateral discourse. Mm -hmm. I think it actually requires bilateral initiatives. Mm -hmm. we, we do need a, an initiative from this White House mm -hmm. to advance this topic. Mm -hmm. And I just would put this in very concrete terms with two of the episodes that uh, we've been dealing with that I've been dealing with just since the first of this year because I, to me they dramatize and illustrate everything that is at stake. One was January. January the 7th, there was the, this horrific Charlie Hebdo attack in Paris. As we also saw, there was the largest manhunt in France in the last 20 years. The very next day, January the 8th, the French authorities realized that both of the terrorists that were at large had Microsoft email accounts. They did not do what the US government is trying to do, reach this unilaterally. They worked with the US government. They, they went to the FBI. The very next day, the FBI served on us an emergency request under ECPA to require us to turn over their email. 
It was all lawful. It was done on a bilateral basis. And even though that arrived at 547 in the morning on the West Coast, we did the legal review and turned over those emails in 45 minutes, mm -hmm. which proves to me that when governments try to work together, it actually is possible. Now, I'll give you the contrasting example. One of the more memorable meetings that I've had in the last couple of months, the CFO of our subsidiary in Brazil is sitting in my office. This is like one of the worst kinds of meetings you can have if you're a lawyer. Because here's somebody who you're supposed to serve. And this poor fellow is telling me what I already knew. The Brazilian government is indicting and prosecuting him for misdemeanor charges because he is a Microsoft employee. And Microsoft is not turning over unilaterally to the Brazilian law enforcement authorities certain Skype chat data that exists on a server in the United States. And he and I are talking, and I'm explaining to him what he already knows, that we're not turning this over because we would commit a felony under US wiretapping law if we turn this over directly to the Brazilians. The Brazilians are not doing what the French did. They're not working through a bilateral arrangement, just as the US is not working through a bilateral arrangement with the Irish, even though the Irish have said they have a great bilateral arrangement and they're waiting to put it to work. This is the legal definition of a mess <laughs> with you know, substantial personal ramifications for great individuals that should not have to face these kinds of problems. They're just trying to deliver technology. The only way to move technology forward and preserve the global nature of the internet is, in my view, to get governments working together, well, bilaterally and then ultimately multilaterally as well. Well, thank you very much uh, for sharing those examples. I think it's really important that those examples be part of the public discourse, and they frankly rarely are. And I, I suppose it, it does lead me to ask one last question, which is one of um, instilling trust. Um, trust in governments uh, and for firms that are subject to uh, uh, requirements of sharing information, trust in companies, um, and in particularly, I suppose, American companies operating globally. Do you have some further thoughts around that? Well, first of all, I would say you know, the, one of the biggest differences for information technology today compared to, say, 20 or 30 years ago is today information technology companies have become a lot more like banks. Um, you know, we've long recognized, certainly since the Great Depression, that the foundation for banking was trust, mm -hmm. consumer trust, that mm -hmm. the money would be there when they went to get it. Uh, you know, for us now, we're asking consumers and companies and governments around the world to put their most important information, their data, in a data center. So trust is now as important to information technology as it has been historically to finance. Trust has been put into jeopardy by this waves, this set of waves of, you know, in the wake of the Snowden attack, the, the Snowden disclosures, the, 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 the Sony attack, and, and the like. We need to rebuild trust. Um, we're working to do that. You know, in the tech sector, uh, we're using technology to rebuild trust. Um, a lot of this is around stronger encryption, for example, which is now, I think, rapidly emerging as one of the most potentially contentious issues in a number of countries around the world. Um, but it is such an important technology for restoring trust. Um, but we need tech companies to take steps to restore trust, and we need to recognize that in no small measure, it was governments that put this trust at risk. It was the US government and the disclosures that have come out. The North Koreans have not helped. Let's be clear about that. Other governments are not helping either. We need governments to act in what I would call the public interest and the global public interest mm -hmm. to help restore trust in technology. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. This has been a fantastic conversation. I know it will doubtless have provoked, uh, I hope, uh, many interesting questions. Could I invite uh, some questions uh, from our audience? Please raise your hand. We'll have a mic brought to you. Yes? Please uh, bring uh, Andrew McLaughlin. Uh, 
Um, thank you very much. I love the, the contrasting examples of the French and Brazilian um, uh, cases that you have dealt with over the last couple of months. Um, is the difference between the two uh, that one has an MLAT and therefore everything was smooth and procedural, the other does not, um, at least not one that covers the kinds of acts that's in question? I know we have some kind of an MLAT with Brazil, but I don't think it's got the sort of dual criminality uh, provisions that would apply to that. Um, uh, conduct, and I'll just say as an aside, I used to be at Google and it dealt with exactly the same thing right. where we had an indicted official because it was child protection related stuff, and the answer there, which was a total unsatisfying hack, was that we set up a front end server into which we could uh, store data that they wanted and therefore not violate ECPA, give them the right. data and so forth, and then uh, that leads to a whole bunch of other unsatisfying questions like why don't you store everything that relates to Brazilians yeah. here and you're into that rabbit hole. But anyway, to what extent is, is this a, uh, legal difference which could be solved through the negotiation of MLATs with everybody we want to be doing uh, business with, and to what extent is it kind of a, a question of culture, pride, priorities, governmental habits, and so forth? I actually think it's both, and, and you make a great point, and, and I think you're also right to observe that, look, ultimately the answer will be in some respects that companies do have to put more data in certain countries, which takes you back to data residency and data localization that's being, in effect, you know, compelled through these kinds of steps, and one can debate the pros and cons of that. But, but to your question, fundamentally, it's been interesting, because I, as, as we look at the pattern that emerges around the world, you know, one might think that you simply see governments push this the hardest when they don't have a mutual legal assistance treaty with the other country where the data reside. And if so, you'd say, I get it. The answer is clear, let's go improve these MLATs, which we do need to do. I mean, they're 19th century instruments legally in a way that need to be brought into the 21st century. But what I also find just so interesting is that actually it doesn't tend to explain the phenomenon very broadly. Ireland and the United States have a very strong MLAT. The US government is saying, we get it, but we're not going to use it. Um, you know, we have other instances, you know, Belgium and Luxembourg. <laughs> You'd think if any two countries have close legal connections and they do, it would be those two. And yet you have these cases coming out of Belgium where the Belgian police are saying, we're not going to use the MLAT, we just want the, the technology provider to turn the information over. And, yeah, I, I constantly think we have to remind ourselves, I, you know, Law enforcement is doing vitally important work. We all want the public to be safe. Um, but I will say there's just sort of an aspect of human nature at work here. Um, if people have a process that works, they're reluctant to change unless they need to. And they're particularly reluctant to change if they look at the alternative and they see that the alternative has defects of its own. And it's easy to look at the MLATs around the world and say these things are slow, they haven't been modernized, et cetera. But I also th think that the real question that should call is how do we make these things better? Ultimately, all problems are insurmountable if you don't try to solve them. And there are, a, there are definitely a number of problems that the world can solve, in my view, if only we try mm -hmm. and we work together. And I just don't see enough people yet try. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Other questions? I think, do I see a hand over here? No? Oh, yes, OK. Could you please identify yourself when you get the mic? Good afternoon. Um, so I'll, my name is Megan Stiefel, and I'll preface my remarks with the fact that I'm a former NSC staffer and DOJ attorney uh, <laughs> in both the Criminal and National Security Division. So I wondered if you could. Um, as maybe this is a follow-up question. If you could talk a little bit more about what you mean by governments working together, working together multilaterally. Um, there have been some, I think, who have said that we need to uh, revise, do away with, improve drastically the Budapest Convention. Um, are you thinking more along those types of lines, or are you thinking more about sort of best practices and greater capacity building um, educational efforts? I think there's probably three or four things, and it's a great question. And it's frankly, um, I, I, I wish your colleagues who are in some of these places today would be asking that. Um, let, let me say, first of all, MLATs need to be modernized. Um, and there's some good concrete ideas that have come from other governments uh, you know, across the Atlantic. 
uh, you know, there are still governments using fax machines uh, because these treaties don't make provision for electronic delivery. Um, they still, in some uh, instances, don't come close to uh, recognizing electronic signatures. Let's just bring these agreements to the level where you know, commerce has now moved. That's a, a first uh, opportunity. I think a second opportunity is to create a new kind of international legal process. I gave a speech in Brussels in January where I described in some detail the kinds of things that we think might be constructive. Um, but I do think, in effect, there is an opportunity for an agreement between, call it, like-minded governments that share a common commitment and legal infrastructure to supporting the rule of law and human rights um, to actually have certain categories of offenses where you know, a government in one country can serve a warrant directly on a service provider, a Google, a Microsoft, you, you name it, um, and you notify the other country, but you can turn it over. And things can move at the same speed, frankly, that they do today. So let's create a new form uh, of legal agreement to then complement the MLATs. Third, let's look at the existing multilateral agreements that are in place today, like the Budapest Convention, and let's see how we make some changes there to bring them into the second decade of the 21st century. And fourth, yes, let's go out and do capacity building because ultimately this is a problem for the world and not just one part of it. So, you know, and, and let's get started. Uh, the sooner we get started, the sooner we're going to start to make some progress. Thank you very much. Other questions? Someone's listening. Ah, <laughs> other, other questions? Yes. Oh, right. David Kirkpatrick. I don't even know the person sitting next to me, but it's related to what she just asked. I wanted to ask Brad to speculate, if you would, because um, you talk about the impact of the Snowden revelations, which everyone here is acutely aware of, and then you talk about how the U.S. is if, if, disregarding this MLAD, and I'm not a lawyer, so I barely even know what that refers to, with Ireland. But I know what the pr mindset is, right? The U.S. is taking advantage of the fact that technology is dominated by U.S. companies, basically. And the question is, do you think that that's still the problem in part in the United States, that there's a kind of imp technological imperialist mindset in effect, that because we do control such a vast percentage of the most powerful internet companies like your own, that our government still has this sort of presumption that because it's American, we have rights to their stuff. And also the presumption that we will continue to prevail technologically, which I think is a very dangerous presumption. But I'm curious for you to speculate in any of that arena. Um, it's a great question, David. And um, yeah, I, I will say the one thing that I've found everywhere in the world is that people with maybe one or two notable exceptions, are more willing to trust their own government than somebody else's government. And oftentimes, their people in government are more likely to trust technology that comes from their own country than from somebody else's country. Americans are more trusting of the US government than Europeans are trusting of the European government, uh, of the American government. People in the US government are more trusting of American technology than people outside the United States. So I think your observation is apt. I think your prognosis, in a sense, is also apt as well. Five years ago, the 10 technology companies in the world that had the highest market cap were all American. Today, three of the 10 are Chinese. The world is changing. To the tech, you know, as technology becomes ubiquitous, by definition, there are going to be more companies that are creating more technology. And frankly, like it or not, and most of us in the tech sector would say not, you know, there is going to be more regulation. Uh, there is going to be more localized regulation. The, the, so what's fundamentally at stake is, will it be good regulation or bad regulation? People, among other things, have to define that. Will it be regulation that promotes a world where ideas and services and products can move around or not. Um, so I, I think we probably have to move from a debate that is premised on this question of, gee, we don't know whether this will be regulated or not, to one that begins to assess 
What does a world of good regulation look like? Thank you very much. One last question. Jason Healy, if we could have the... Uh... Uh, thank you, Jason Healy with SEPA. And we had heard in this morning's session that Vint Cerf said a lot of times when we look at this, we tend to be solving the symptoms rather than the underlying problems. And one of the questions that we've been looking at has been, what have we made, what have we done that's made the most difference in cybersecurity? When we've looked back over the years, what's made the big, what's made the biggest actual change? And we think, you know, the Gates memo of 2003 or, or launching Windows Update, that really was able to just take away entire classes of problems and really start fixing things. And so curious what Microsoft might be doing to address that, Vince, what Vint Cerf brought up, um, to be able to not just treat the symptoms, but some <coughs> of the underlying, uh, underlying things. So what's, what's Microsoft have next, and, and what do you think we need to do? Well, great question, and I'd probably step even farther back and you know, put things into sort of three or four you know, brief eras. But there was an era where information technology was created without the internet in mind. Yeah, and that was the world up until roughly the year 2000. And then suddenly what we found was that all of these PCs and operating systems that were designed for sort of single use or in a, in a, within an enterprise were being connected to the world and hence had these huge sets of vulnerabilities. So we went through this period of time from sort of 2001 to sort of, say, 2006, 2007, including at Microsoft, perhaps especially at Microsoft, you know, where we were basically updating Windows to build in the security infrastructure for an internet era. Um, you know, then we, we entered an era where things started to move to the cloud. You know, services like search and consumer email being among the first. Um, and people recognized as they did that, that they needed to harden the exterior. You know, so the c companies that were leaders in the industry invested in this. But I think as we got to sort of the 2010 to 2012 time frame, two realizations you know, sort of swept across not just the, the tech sector, but you know, the enterprise community more broadly. The first was that the exterior, the exterior was perhaps not sufficient. And the second was it didn't do the job if you harden the exterior without protecting the interior as well. You know, in other words, you could build the world's best bank, bank vault, but if 500 employees a day could walk into the vault and carry out money and you didn't even know it, you had a problem. So you see, we've seen this wave uh, over the last, I'd say, three or four years across tech and business and government where people are improving their processes. Now, I, I would say that in 2014, unfortunately, we entered a new era. Because the Sony attack was really different in two significant ways. One is it was a nation state attack. Now, there's been nation state espionage before, but not kind, this not an attack. And second, it was unlike any other attack it was more like an act of vandalism. You know, it was intended to just destroy the network, the data, the machines, the fundamental ability uh, of people to use their information infrastructure. Um, you know, so where do we go now? Well, you know, the industry's hard at work. Every you, know, you can't be on a public sector board today without you know, talking about about cybersecurity. Uh, you know, we will harden technology further, business processes will improve, interaction between the public and private sectors you know, will in some respects accelerate. Ultimately, I think what it means is we are in an era where we need to recognize that there's you know, multiple values at stake. There's a value that's called keeping the public safe. There's a value that's called keeping data secure. There's a value that's called you know, protecting people's privacy. And you know, the reason that this whole discussion is so nuanced uh, and difficult in some ways and yet of fundamental importance is they are intention and yet they need to be balanced. Uh, 
And governments are no longer prepared to leave this to business, nor are they prepared to leave it to just one or two governments. Every government around the world is asking itself the same question, how is it going to strike this balance? And now we're going to see all of this unfold. That's the next decade. How are we going to work on this in a way that ensures that technology advances, these values are reconciled, and hopefully out of it all, you still have an internet that retains some of the fundamental global character that has made it so valuable to the world as a whole. Well, uh, Brad, I think you've just said, you know, with great eloquence, you know, the, the, the whole rationale for this gathering and, uh, uh, and our desire to engage all of these issues in the kind of interdisciplinary way with the diverse constituencies that have to come together and I think you have a very unique and deep perspective around all of it. So I'm enormously grateful that you've come. I know you made a special effort to do so at a really busy time of year. So please join me in thanking Brad Smith.